to all of you. So we're already finished with chapter 3, which is all about processes now. We're already in chapter 4, which is all about threads and concurrency. So I hope that you are ready again to learn new concepts in our subject, Operating Systems. So let's start our lesson for chapter 4. Okay, so the contents of chapter 4 are overview, multi-core programming, multi-threading models, thread libraries, implicit threading, threading issues, and operating system examples. So the objectives for this chapter are identify the basic concepts of a thread and contrast threads and processes, describe the benefits and challenges of designing multi-threaded applications, illustrate different approaches to implicit threading including thread pools, fork join, and grand central dispatch, describe how the Windows and Linux operating systems represent threads, design multi-threaded applications using the pthreads, Java, and Windows threading APIs. So the motivation for this concepts of threads, because most modern applications are multi-threaded, and then threads run within application. Multiple tasks with the application can be implemented by separate threads such as update display, fetch data, spelling checking, and answer a network request. So process creation is actually heavyweight while thread creation is lightweight. And thread creation can simplify code, increase efficiency, and another motivation is that kernels are generally multi-threaded. So let's look at uh, the comparison between the single and multi-threaded processes. So for a single threaded process, so they have this code data files and uh, the thread has, uh, has their own registers, program counter, and stack. So this is the single threaded process while the multi-threaded process, of course, inside a process. So for example, we have an example, three threads inside a process. As you can see, the difference is that the threads have their own set of register stack and program counter so this other thread has their own set also and then also the third thread and then they're only sharing the code data and files with each other so we have also an illustration of a multi-threaded server architecture example a client will request uh, to the server and then the server create a new thread to service the request and then this is the thread instead of creating a process and then number three is resume listening for additional client requests so what are the benefits of using threads first is we have responsiveness may allow continued execution if part of process is blocked especially important for user interfaces another one is we have resource sharing Threads share resources of process, as we can see, for the code, data, and files. Easier than shared memory or message passing, as we have learned uh, from the previous lesson, from the Chapter 3 processes. And the next is we have economy. Cheaper than process creation. Thread switching lower overhead than context switching. And then next is we have scalability. Process can take advantage of multi-core architectures. So for multi-core programming, the multi-core or multi-processor systems putting pressure on programmers that these challenges include the dividing of activities, the balance, the data splitting, the data dependency, and testing and debugging. So we have this concept, parallelism, implies a system can perform more than one task simultaneously. And another concept is concurrency, supports more than one task making progress. So for a single processor or single core architecture, scheduler provide scheduler is the one that provides a concurrency. So we have the comparison between concurrency and parallelism. So for this first illustration, so concurrent execution on a single core system, meaning um, your processor only has a single core, has a single brain. So this colored blue here are, for example, threads of P sub zero. And then the gray, uh, the gray color here are the threads of P sub 1. So how are we going to execute concurrency on a single core system? So as you can see, there's a context switching between thread of P sub 0 and thread of P sub 1. So as you, as you have learned with context switching in chapter 3. 
it's uh the the threads of the process are done alternately so first is for p sub zero then p sub one p sub zero again p sub one so on and so forth okay so that is concurrent c what about parallelism on multi-core? So, parallelism is more uh, on multi-core system. Because, for example, we have core 1 and core 2. So, for core 1, all the threads of process P sub 0 are assigned to core 1. And all the threads assigned to process P sub 1 are all in core 2. And then, they execute all at the same time. So, in compared with concurrent, it is alternate alternate execution between threads of process P sub 0 and P sub 1. So, that's the difference between concurrency and parallelism. So, let's continue for multi-core programming. So, types of parallelism. So, we have data parallelism. Distribute subsets of the same data across multiple cores. Same operation on each. While task parallelism distributing threads across cores each thread performing a unique operation so we have a illustration here of data parallelism so the for data parallelism the subsets of data which are the same to other cores are given from for example core 0 to core 3 and they have the same operation and while the task parallelism meaning each thread is assigned to each core but they are doing different task. So, that's the difference between data parallelism and task parallelism. So, next is we have this law. We have Amdahl's law. So, it identifies performance gains from adding additional cores to an application that has both serial and parallel components. So, S here is the serial portion. So, S and then N are the processing cores or the number of processors. So, that is, for example, we have an example here. If application is 75% parallel, uh, then 25% serial. So, 75 plus 25, so it equals to 100% or 0 0.75 plus 0 0.25 is equal to 1. So, that's the one, uh, one actually 1 here. So, moving from 1 to 2 cores, uh, for example, you, you decided to add additional core, it becomes 2. So, it results in speed up of 1.6 times. So, uh, how did we get the answer? So, let me just demonstrate it. So, for speed up, so we have 1 over, so S is serial. So, we have 0 0.25. So, sorry for my handwriting and I'm left-handed but because of the mouse, I'm using right hand, right hand, uh, writing and for right hand, using the mouse. Okay, let's continue. Then plus, okay, we have 1 minus S. So, S here is the 0 0.25, but since 1 minus S is 1 minus 0 0.25, actually, this is equivalent to 0 0.75. And then, okay, divided by, okay, from 1, you decided to put 2 cores. Okay. Okay, next is we have, okay, 1 over, so what's the 0 0.75 divided by 2 is we have 0 0.75. 375, okay, 375, then plus, plus 0 0.25, and then if you're going to add the 2, 0 0.25 plus 0 0.375, so we have 1 over 0 0.6. 5 if we add both and then 1 divided by 0 0.625 is what is equivalent to this one to 1.6 times so it means that speed up so speed up
is less than or equal to 1.6 times. Or 1.6. Okay. So, meaning, if for, for this example, if you add two cores to the system, um, the speed up will approach uh, less than or equal 1.6 times. Okay. Then, as n approaches infinity, speed up approaches 1 over s. So, serial portion of an application has disproportionate effect on performance gain by adding additional cores. But, does the law take into account contemporary multi-core systems? Actually, for Amdal's law, so I, I actually have this, uh, I've watched a video in study.com that, or uh, to explain Amdal's law. For example, you have a system. For example, you have processor, memory, and hard drive. Of course, the processor is the fastest, then next is main memory, and the slowest is hard drive. Um, for example, there are, there, there are, per, these are persons. Example, and then they're going to attend the party. The condition is that for them to attend the party, they should arrive all at the same time. They cannot, uh, and for example, if processor is the fastest, he cannot enter the, the party venue if main memory and hard drive is not yet, is not, uh, are not yet with him. So, that's an example. So, for example, CPU, since the fastest, for example, he, he will go to the party by using his sports car while the main memory is using uh, his or her motorcycle or motorbike while the hard drive, of course, he or she is the slowest. So, he'll be, uh, he or she will be using, um, um, he will travel by foot. So, since this is a system, so what are your concerns uh, how are you going to speed up the process? Of course, you are concerning with the hard drive. So, you're not concerning anymore with the CPU and the main memory because they are relatively uh, fast. So, to speed up the whole system, you must concentrate on the hard drive. So, actually, this is for the uh, Amdahl's law. So, uh, for the question, but, but does the law take into account contemporary multi-core systems? Of course, um, uh, adding additional course will make it faster but if you're going to look the computer in a uh, in a whole perspective so it's not just the multi-core but also the components that it is installed that's why as you can see now uh, with the emergent uh, emergence of solid state disk the ssd uh, many people if you're watching videos on the internet they're switching from hard drives to ssd because they can see uh, the relative uh, they can see actually the results that the system is faster if uh, if a person is using an SSD instead of a hard disk drive. Okay, so we have this Amdahl's law. So this red one here is the ideal speed. So uh, we have the S. S means serial, meaning um, if you're going to process something, it will be in sequential fashion. Um, unlike with parallel, you can finished jobs, uh, you're doing it all at the same time. So, for this, S is equals to 0 0.5. So, if you're going to add cores, for example, 16 and above, as you can see here, we have the serial, is, serial process is 0 0.5. So, meaning, the parallel operation of the system is 95%. So, you can see that uh, for S is equal 0 0.5, uh, the number of processing cores affects also the speed because the, pro the parallel process or operations in the system is 95% compared to serial which is only 5%. Then for the blue one, so we have 0.10 for the uh, uh, series operation. So meaning 90% of the operations are done in parallel. So also, uh, it will also increase the, uh, it will uh, speed up but it's still lower than the green one because of course the parallel operations here are 95 then for blue it's 90 and then the last that you can um, notice is that, for example, what if the serial and parallel are in 50-50, half, 50% 50 are done in series, and then 50% of the pro of the operations are done in parallel. As you can see, there is only a little difference if you're going to add cores. So that's why for the pink one, 
um, there is a, a, a significant sh- uh, uh, in insig- actually it's an insignificant change because um, it depends upon the operations of the system. If it's mostly parallel operations, um, adding cores to the computer will benefit the computer system. But if the a series operations in the computer system is higher than parallel, so adding cores will 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 not really help at all. Okay, next is we have user threads and kernel threads. So, user threads, management done by user level threads library. So, three primary thread libraries are the POSIX-P threads, Windows threads, and Java threads. And then, if we have user threads, we also have kernel threads. It is supported, of course, by the kernel. Examples, virtually all general purpose operating systems including Windows, Linux, Mac OS, 10, iOS, Android, they have kernel threads. So this is an illustration of the user and kernel threads. So we have the user space, so it has a corresponding user threads, and the kernel space also has its corresponding kernel threads inside. So wh- what, are, what are the multi-threading models between the user threads and kernel threads? So we have many-to-one, one-to-one, and many to many so first is we have many to one so many user level threads map to single kernel thread so one thread blocking causes all to block and then multiple threads may not run in parallel on multi-core system because only one may be in the kernel at a time so this is the advantage of this advantage of many to one even though the architecture or the system is a multi-core system, since uh, there uh, only one kernel thread, uh, uh, all the user threads are only mapped to one kernel thread, uh, you cannot maximize the potential of a multi-core system. So few systems currently use this model. So this mo- uh, these uh, systems are the Solaris Green Threads and GANU Portable Threads. So again, many to one, many user threads are mapped to only one kernel threads so another one is we have one-to-one so each user level thread maps to kernel thread creating a user level thread creates a kernel thread a corresponding kernel thread and more concurrency than many to one and number of threads per process sometimes restricted due to overhead so the systems that uses the one-to-one one user thread per kernel thread is we have windows and Linux. And we also have this one, the many-to-many model. Allows many user level threads to be mapped to many kernel threads. Allows the operating system to create a sufficient number of kernel threads. So Windows is also um, utilizing this model but specifically with the thread fiber package. Otherwise, this is not uh, this is not very common or uncommon for systems. So again, uh, user many user level threads is also connected to many other kernel threads or mapped. Okay, if we have one to one, many to one, and many to many, we also have this two level model. So similar to many to many, so this is the many to many, except that it allows a user thread to be bound to kernel threads. So it's like a combination of many to many and one to one model okay next is we have thread libraries so thread library provides programmer with api for creating and managing threads true pi- primary ways of implementing library entirely in user space and kernel level library supported by the os so first is we have p threads so may be provided either as a user level or kernel level a POSIX standard IEEE 1003.1C API for thread creation and synchronization. So for P threads, it's a specification, not implementation. So API specifies behavior of the thread library. Implementation is up to the development of the of the library. So P threads are common in Unix operating systems such as Linux and Mac OS 10. So we have a pthreads example. Actually, this code, what is this doing? 
This demonstrate P-Threads API for constructing multi-threaded program that calculates the summation of a non-negative number in a separate thread. So, as you can see here, we have print is uh, print f sum is equal to percent d box dash n sum. So, it calculates the summation of a non-negative number. So, this uses threads. And then we also have uh, code for p thread p threads code for joining 10 threads so you have to define num threads which is equal to 10 and then this is the code for joining this 10 threads okay we have another um, code this is also the same um, summation of non-negative number in a separate thread but it is implemented using the windows multi-threaded c program so just the same the same uh, operation with p threads uh, pro, uh, code next is we have java threads so java threads are managed by the jvm or the java virtual machine so typically implemented using threads model provided by underlying os and then java threads may be created by extending thread class and implementing the runnable interface such as this is the code for the implementation of the runnable interface and standard practice is to implement runnable interface so this is the code for implementing runnable interface and then for creating the thread and then for waiting the waiting on a thread and then we have this java executor framework so rather than explicitly creating threads Java also allows thread creation around the executor uh, interface. So we have this one, the code for instead of creating um, explicitly uh, explicit threads. So this can also be done with executor interface. And then how to implement the executor? This is the code for using the executor. So this is the code for uh, Java executor framework, which is just the same of summation of a non-negative number in a separate thread. Just the same. The same results, but different um, different code because first is pthreads, Windows, and then we have Java, but with the same results. Okay, next is we have implicit threading. It is growing in popularity as number of threads increase. Program correctness more difficult with explicit threads. And then creation and management of threads done by compilers and runtime libraries rather than programmers. So five methods are explored in implicit threading such as thread pools, fork join, open MP, grand central dispatch, and Intel threading building blocks. So let's go first with thread pools. So create a number of threads in a pool where they await work. So advantages of creating thread pools. So usually slightly faster to service a request with an existing thread than create a new thread. Allows the number of threads in the applications to be bound to the size of the pool. And then separating tasks to be performed from mechanics of creating tasks allows different strategies for running tasks. So tasks could be scheduled to run periodically. So Windows API supports thread pools so by means of this code this code for thread pools so java also has its own thread pool so three factory methods for creating thread pools and executors class such as new single thread executor new fixed thread pool and new cached thread pool and then this is where you apply those um, lines of code to create uh, thread pools Okay, next is we also have fork join parallelism. So multiple threads, if broken down, it becomes task. These are fork and then join. So for, we have an illustration. We have a main thread. Then fork meaning it creates a child process. So for main, for main thread, uh, these are divided into task. And then after each task is finished, this will be uh, joined again. And then it will form again the main thread. So this is the general algorithm for fork join strategy. So to illustrate the algorithm, so for example, we have a task 
and then it will be divided into two and then these two tasks are also divided into two it looks like a three and then after this task and this task is finished it will be joined to this task and at the same time the same goes with these two tasks it will be joined to their parent task and then after these tasks are finished it they will be joined with their own parent task so we also have a fork join parallelism in java so this is the code for fork join parallelism so the whole code for java and then the fork join task is an abstract based class then recursive task and recursive action classes extend fork join task recursive task returns a result via the return value from the compute method and recursive action does not return a result so we have this fork also so for join task so recursive task and recursive action as is it said that recursive task returns a value while the recursive action does not return a result so that's why it's void okay next is we have open mp so a set of compiler directives and an api for c c plus plus and fortran provides par support for parallel programming in even shared in shared memory environments so identifies parallel regions or blocks of code that can run in parallel so the code for it to for for this one is the number sign pragma omp parallel so this code um creates as many threads as there are a course so it is invoked here and then there's a print f i'm a parallel region so if the system has two course it means it will going to create two threads so the uh, run the for loop in parallel so this is the for loop and next is we have the grand central dispatch so up uh, apple technology for mac os and ios operating system so they're using this grand central dispatch extensions to c c plus plus and objective c languages api and runtime library it allows identification of parallel sections manages most of the details of threading so the block is in with caret and then open and close braces so this is the one so we have caret and then open and close braces print f i'm a block so blocks placed in dispatch queue assigned to available thread in thread pool when removed from queue so two types of dispatch queues is we have the serial so blocks removed in fifo order queue is per process called main queue okay uh, i've already discussed the stack is an approach of last in first out so we have another approach we have the fifo first in first out so this is the normal happening in the line or queue for example, if you're lining up to get food in the canteen, so of course, if you're the first one to arrive and the first one in the line, so of course, you're, you're, you're the one who's going to be uh, served first. So that is why first in, first out. So it's very unfair if you're going to use LIFO, last in, first out, in a line in canteen, in which if you're the last one to 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 arrive still you're the you're also being the first one to be served so um lifo and fifo have their own applications so for lines and queues fifo is used and then programmers can create additional serial queues within program so for concurrent removed in fifo order but several may be removed at a time so for system wide queues divided by quality of service so we have user interactive user initiated user utility and user background so for the swift language a task is defined as a closure similar to a block minus the caret so closures are submitted to the queue using the dispatch underscore async function so as we have as we have said grand central dispatch is similar to a block instead there is no caret before Okay, next is we have the Intel Threading Building Blocks or TBB, template library for designing parallel C++ programs, a serial version of a simple for loop. So, it looks like a for loop for 
uh, C program. So, the same for loop written using TBB with parallel underscore for statements. Just the same. It's just for the for. They have the parallel before. Then underscore for. Undersigned rather. Okay. So, next is we have threading issues. So, semantics of for and exec system calls. Then next is we have seen signal handling. Is it synchronous or asynchronous? Thread cancellation of target thread, asynchronous or deferred, thread local storage or scheduler activate, activation. So we're going to discuss is ne next. So first is we have semantics of fork and ex exec functions. So does fork duplicate only the calling thread or all threads? So it depends upon the system. So some Unix systems, so some Unix, uh, Unixes have two versions of fork. And then exec function usually works as normal. Replace the running process including all threads. So next is we have signal handling. Signals are used in Unix systems to notify a process that a particular event has occurred. So we have a signal handler is used to process signals. So first is signal is generated by particular event. Number two, signal is delivered to a process. Number three, Signal is handled by one of two signal handlers, which is the default and user defined. So every signal has default handler that kernel runs when handling signal, but there is also a user defined signal handler can override default for single threaded signal delivered to process. So where should a signal be delivered for multi threaded? So these are the possible solutions. So, deliver the signal to the thread to which the signal applies or deliver the signal to every thread in the process, deliver the signal to certain threads in the process, and assign a specific thread to receive all signals for the process. So, next is we have thread cancellation. So, thread cancellation, terminating a thread before it has finished. So, thread to be cancelled is target thread. There are two general approaches we have. Asynchronous cancellation terminates the target thread immediately without waiting for a specific time. Then deferred cancellation allows the target thread to periodically check if it should be cancelled. So P thread code to create and cancel a thread. So this one is to create a thread. Then the next is we have to cancel a thread. So, invoking thread cancellation requests cancellation, but actual cancellation depends on the thread state. So, the states are the off, deferred, and asynchronous. So, if thread has cancellation disabled or the mode is off, cancellation remains pending until thread enables it. So, the default type uh, of mode for the thread is deferred. So, cancellation only occurs when thread reaches cancellation point. Such as, uh, for example, there is a code, line of code, p thread underscore test cancel fun then function. And then after executing this is we have clean up handler is invoked. So on Linux systems, thread cancellation is handled through signals. So what about thread cancellation in Java? So deferred cancellation uses the interrupt function method, which sets the interrupted status of a thread. So, this is the code. Before you uh, cancel, it must use the interrupt method. So, a thread can check to see if it has been interrupted. So, again, for Java, thread cancellation, to cancel a thread, it must use interrupt method first. And then check if it has been interrupted. So, next is we have thread local storage or TLS allows each thread to have its own copy of data. Useful when you, you do not have control over the thread creation process, such as when using a thread pool, and different from local variables. So local variables visible only during single function invocation and TLS visible across function invocations. And then it is similar to static data. So TLS is unique to each thread. So next is we have scheduler activations. Both many-to-many -many and two-level models require communication to maintain the appropriate number of kernel threads allocated to the application. So typically use an intermediate data structure between user and kernel threads which are called the lightweight process or LWP. 
So LWP, so this is the illustration, uh, it acts an intermediate data structure between the user and the kernel threads. So appears to be a virtual processor on which process can schedule user thread to run. Each LWP attached to kernel thread. So the question now is how many LWPs to, to create? Actually, there is no prescribed as long as um, the, the application must have an, a sufficient number of threads to run efficiently. So scheduler activations provide app calls, a communication mechanism from the kernel to the app call handler in the thread library. This communication allows an application to maintain the correct number of kernel threads. So next is we have the operating system example of how does the Windows and Linux um, apply or implement their threads. So we have Windows threads and Linux threads. So for Windows threads, we have Windows API, primary API for Windows applications. Uh, as you can remember, Windows implements the one-to-one -one mapping kernel level. Then each thread contains a thread ID, register set representing state of processor, separate user and kernel stacks for when thread runs in user mode or kernel mode, private data storage area used by runtime libraries and dynamic link libraries or DLLs. So the register set, stacks, and private storage area are known as the context of the thread. So the primary data structures of a thread for Windows is we have the e-thread or the executive thread block, include pointer to process to which thread belongs and to k-thread in kernel space. k-thread or the kernel thread block, scheduling and synchronization information, kernel mode stack, pointer to TEB, the other um, data structure of a thread in kernel space. And then we have the TEB, thread environmental block, we have the thread, thread ID, user, user mode stack, thread local storage in user space. So this is an illustration of the Windows Threads data structure. So TEB, it is located in the user space while um, eThread and kthread are inside the kernel space. So the eThread contains thread start addresses, pointer to parent process, and it has a pointer to kthread which kthread contains scheduling and synchronization information and kernel stack and as enumerated in the previous slide. And of course, TEB, kthread has a pointer to TEB. So TEB contains thread identifier, user stack, thread local storage, and others. Okay, next is we have Linux threads. So Linux refers to them as tasks rather than threads. Thread creation is done through clone system call. So clone function allows a child task to share the address space of the parent task or process. So these are the flag controls behavior. So clone underscore fs, file system information is shared. Clone underscore vm, the same memory space is shared. Clone underscore sighand, signal handlers are shared. And clone underscore files, the set of open files is shared. So the structure or the struct task underscore struct points to process data structure. It may be shared or unique. So this is already the end of our lesson for today about threads and concurrency. So I hope that uh, you've learned something uh, with our uh, lesson for today. So if you do have any questions, so feel please feel free to comment below. And please don't forget to like my YouTube channel. So thank you very much. Good day and stay safe.